So let's draw this podcast to a close with some discussion of what to do if you have diabetes, what to do if you are pre-diabetic, what to do if you have a high fasting insulin. The first thing to know here is that it, you better know if you're on the train, right? If you're on the diabetes train, you better know and you better get off. How do you know? Get a freaking fasting insulin. What should it be? It should be less than five. Ideally, it should be less than three micro IU per ml. If your fasting insulin is eight, you've got a problem. That's the average in the country. And remember, most of the country is pre-diabetic and has metrics which suggest that they have metabolic syndrome. So get off the train. How do you do that? Reduce the amount of linoleic acid in your diet as much as possible. How do you do that? Get rid of seed oils. Stop canola, stop corn, stop cotton seeds, stop soybean, stop them all. If you wanna use olive, it's better than all those, but it still has more linoleic acid than I think is ideal for humans. And I think the ideal situation for most humans would be tallow, ghee, or butter. Yes, they may raise your LDL for reasons I've spoken about in other podcasts. No, I don't think that's a problem because you will become insulin sensitive as you make these changes in your diet. And I believe that insulin sensitivity is the single greatest important metric to know about when you are thinking about your cardiovascular risk, your risk of high blood pressure, dementia, cancer, et cetera. As I said, this is the single most important part of any one of your health journeys, knowing how insulin sensitive you are, knowing you if you are on the diabetes train. So there is a great trial that I talked about on the podcast a couple of weeks ago with John Abramson. That was a really interesting one looking at pharma corruption. This is the Diabetes Prevention Program Trial. This is a reduction in the incidence of type 2 diabetes with lifestyle intervention or metformin. What's most striking about this study is that if you look at this, lifestyle change was significantly better at reducing diabetes incidence than a drug metformin. But what did my sister's mother-in-law get recommended? Metformin. What was the lifestyle modification here? They were goals of at least 7% weight loss, 150 minutes of physical activity per week. That was it. Weight loss and physical activity significantly improved diabetes and metrics of insulin sensitivity much more than metformin, a drug that we know has significant side effects, including lowering B12 and other negative side effects. Yes, it will improve things in the short term, but I think that it would be much better to change the lifestyle. And the adherence here was very good. People did this lifestyle intervention when it was coached properly to them. I think that if they'd added reduction in linoleic acid to this program, they would have seen even more improvement in diabetic metrics. So yes, metformin is a drug that works. Yes, there are drugs that work for diabetes. No, they do not treat the root cause. And yes, they will have side effects that come with them, which I think can be very negative for humans. So another very interesting thing that I want to talk about is a ketogenic diet. Many of you know, if you've listened to my recent discussions, that I think for those of us who are insulin sensitive, a ketogenic diet is not worth it. Including carbohydrates in my diet was a very significant improvement in my overall health. I had improvements in muscle cramping, testosterone, sleep, et cetera, because we need postprandial insulin to hold on to electrolytes. For those of you who have insulin resistance, doing a ketogenic diet, for those of you who have insulin resistance, an elevated fasting insulin above five or even eight, I think a ketogenic diet can be very helpful in the short term, and I'll tell you why. One of the physiologic processes that happens in a ketogenic diet is called beta oxidation. That's how we break down fatty acid molecules and part of how ketones are made. Well, as it turns out, beta oxidation is also the pathway by which HNE is broken down. And in studies in animal models, which probably have the same physiology as humans, putting animals into a ketogenic state increased beta oxidation and led to higher levels of HNE breakdown. I get asked a question all the time, how do I get rid of excess seed oils in my body? And I didn't really have a good answer other than eating higher amounts of animal fats and lower amounts of linoleic acid in your diet and getting rid of all the oils that have excess amounts of linoleic acid, including olive oil, until I saw this study recently. And it made me think, hmm, I guess there probably really is a reasonable hypothesis here that if you have diabetes and insulin resistance, some term of ketogenesis, maybe, maybe cyclic ketogenesis, maybe six months to a year, may improve your body's disposal of these aldehyde breakdown products as that linoleic acid is broken down or oxidized in your human body. Maybe people with diabetes really should be on a ketogenic diet to upregulate beta oxidation to quote unquote detoxify HNE. It's a compelling hypothesis that I think needs to be tested. We need to look at people and their levels of HNE on ketogenic diets. Now, what we know is that people on ketogenic diets seem to do pretty well with diabetes. I just think that that gets conflated with being on a ketogenic diet all the time, and I've seen that be very harmful for many people. So the takeaway here is that if you have diabetes, if you have insulin resistance, 
doing a low carbohydrate diet, doing a very low carbohydrate diet may be beneficial by upregulating beta oxidation. My colleagues in the ketogenic world would be very excited that I'm saying this because I've not been super excited about ketogenic diets for many of you in the past. And upregulation of beta oxidation may help us get rid of HNE faster, may improve this process. So I think that's a reasonable thing to do for many of you um, who are in this position. If you are someone that is insulin sensitive, I think getting carbohydrates in your diet is a very valuable thing. And I think that many people who have diabetes will not need to be ketogenic long-term. I think you can reverse the diabetes. Perhaps you get rid of the HNE through beta oxidation. Perhaps you change the dietary composition of these oils and you get rid of that excess linoleic acid. We know there's a turnover there in your body gradually over time. And once that linoleic acid and those breakdown products are gone, have returned to what I considered physiologic normal levels, evolutionarily consistent levels, then you probably can include carbohydrates back in your diet and get the benefits of those foods, such as electrolyte maintenance because of postprandial insulin at the level of the kidney, something I've talked about previously on why I quit a ketogenic diet, dangers of a ketogenic diet type of video. So hopefully that all makes sense in the context of this further discussion. So in summary, if you're on the diabetes train, if your fasting glucose is elevated, if your A1C is elevated, if your fasting insulin is elevated, get off the train. How do you do that? I think it's pretty obvious you want to get rid of processed sugars, but you also want to get rid of seed oils that are high in linoleic acid. That piece is what is not discussed. That piece is what I think that piece is what I think is mainly missed. Even the Mayo Clinic is recommending that you eat seed oils, despite the fact there is good evidence that those oils break down into toxic aldehyde products that lead to broken fat cells with impaired adipogenesis, with impaired hyperplasia, increased levels of oxidative stress, free fatty acids in the bloodstream, and diabetic physiology. Why are we not getting those out of our diet? I don't know. When there's good trials that show improved weight loss, improved insulin sensitivity with lowering linoleic acid in your diet. How do you get the lowest levels of linoleic acid in your diet? You eat something like tallow or butter or ghee for your animal fats, for all of your fats. You don't even eat olive oil, though olive oil is probably much better than things like canola, definitely better than things like cottonseed, soybean, grapeseed, et cetera. I know many of you will ask about avocado oil. I'm not a huge fan of this. I previously did a reel on this, and I think I've talked about it in previous podcasts. If you look at the quality of avocado oils, they're generally very bad, they're oxidized, and many of them are cut with vegetable oils. I don't see the point of avocado oil when you could use a animal fat. And I think that in general, extra virgin olive oil is probably gonna be better quality than most avocado oils, but even that has more linoleic acid than an, an animal fat. So I think that if you use olive oil, we just don't know if that's going to slow your progression, slow your improvement from a diabetic, pre-diabetic state. And I don't miss anything not having olive oil in my diet. I don't understand why most people actually cook in oils in the first place. I use a grill and I cook my meat on the grill. And if I need more fat on the meat, which I often do, even with 80, 20 ground beef, I want it to be fattier. I'll use a raw butter or a tallow on there. So those are the animal fats that I think are the best. They're the lowest in linoleic acid. So that I think paired with re removal of excess carbohydrates, grain-based carbohydrates, high fructose corn syrup from your diet will result in improvements in your diabetes. That's how you do it. The Mayo Clinic has it partially right, but they're way off base in terms of the oils. And perhaps that's why so many people continue to get diabetes, get diagnosed with diabetes, because we're not telling them the dangers of these oils. Like I've said before on other podcasts, like I've said on Instagram content, there should be a warning label on the side of a Lay's package with somebody who's morbidly obese, who has erectile dysfunction, sleep apnea, and perhaps other issues, including diabetes, because those foods lead to those states. And we're not being honest about that with consumers. We do it on the side of cigarettes. I think this is exactly the same thing with regard to junk foods, but we need to really push for more research in this space so that the entire medical community can wake up and realize how they've been misled and how badly uh, they're being taught, especially in medical schools. That's something that's a real problem for me um, in the medical school equation right now.